Okay, so now let's continue because we're going to see some method to the madness here. Up here, this window, is our friend Matthew. Clearly, Luke is matching his meter to Matthew and he's reordering the words just the same. So then the question is, well, why is Luke doing that? Okay, see, because look, up here, right here, Plepete metes humas planese. See to it that you don't get to see, that nobody misleads you, technically is what he's saying. You'll notice that's at 169. But Luke sticks that same phrase, instead of at 169, he puts it here and he sevens it. See, Odaipen is not the words. He's saying, and he said. All right. And he sticks it up here at 112, not at 169. See, it's at 169 here, going from 159, really 160, to 169 here in Matthew. But Luke sticks it up higher and puts it here ending at 112. Why is he doing that? Now, I don't know how good, you know, or, you know, what pastor you're under and how much the pastors actually go through the original language's text. Mine did. And when he covers stuff like this, he explains that when you see wording in a, in a book that's talking about, that's quoting, but it's not exactly the same, there's a term for that which you learn in seminary, of course, called interpretative quoting. It's not unique to the Bible. It happens in a lot of places. You do it all the time, but you just haven't thought about it. Like if you said windows, W-I-N-D-O-Z-E, you're actually quoting the, the, the software name, windows, but you're making a comment on it because you're talking about how slow it is when you say D-O-Z-E at the end. Okay? That's, a, that's an interpretative quote, in this case, of a name, Windows. Interpretative quoting, however, can be where you change one word or change another word, or you repeat it in a different place, like it's going on here, to make an application of the quote. See, here's the quote. And everybody, you know, the, Matthew was written in 30 A.D., Luke is written in 58 AD. They both reveal that through their own date lines. Uh, their own text. And Matthew reveals his as in Matthew 1. But also the, the, it's date lined here. This is occurring at syllable 169 and. Which equals 199 AD. That's the key to this thing. And this is at syllable 112. It's got the same date line to it. Because we saw that here, see, I'm really writing to you 28 years after Christ died. But when he's talking, there were 63 years left on the clock to the millennium pre-church. And I'm th currently 35 years to the millennium pre-church. Because Israel had to know all that. That's a long story that's in the other videos I've done. So at this point, this stands for 142 AD. Whereas this stands for 199 A.D. Well, there's a 50-year difference between them. Okay, see, because you got calculator. All right. We got 169 plus 30 minus 142 in the lower right window. That's orange with the 30 already added. 57 years. That's a really significant number in the Bible. It's the number of days between the beginning of Passover and Pentecost. The occurrence, including the day of Pentecost. Between them is 56. It's one of the most common meters in the Bible, 56. Very commonly used in the Old Testament. So 57 is really pregnant for, you know, the time when Christ is, you know, going to die because he dies on Passover the actual first day of Passover had they done the calendar right and Pentecost when it occurs so you know it's like he's the first fruits he dies 
and then the first fruits is 57 days later and so it's saying something significant about something bad happening here this is the earlier date something bad happening here that has some kind of positive result by the time it gets here the text is the same see to it that, you, that nobody misleads you and then then Luke leaves out those two syllables so he can get his syllable count the way he wants it see to it that you're not misled okay or that you don't go astray and he's using 49 here which is really pregnant because you know 56 minus 7 is 49 this is the number of the diaspora the number of years that Israel first temple was down before the reconstruction began that's why Daniel was praying that's Daniel's own dateline right here to say that he's praying in the 49 years after the temple was down at the beginning of the 49th year so what is the significance of this year why is he bringing that up and why is it 112 well 142 this whole period Israel was completely deceived this is the period of the Bar Kokhba rebellion okay the Bar Kokhba rebellion was technically between 132 and 135 AD it ended by 135 AD Hadrian was still the emperor then and he said that Jerusalem was going to be raised and a pig temple was going to be built and put on top of it and that declaration was made in 135 but the whole process of the building was not complete until around 142 because the whole city was ended up being rebuilt okay so what ended up happening as a result of that rebellion which is yet future when when Luke writes okay and 57 years prior to when Christ says the same phrase all right what was significant about that is that Jews were no longer allowed in Jerusalem now the effect of that was to get all the Christians and all the Jews out of Israel well if they have to leave then they're going to other places and if they're going to other places they're taking their Bibles with them that's the importance that's the whole theme of what what Matthew is talking about and of course Luke Luke also is how does the Bible get out to people how do people get it how do they find out about it how do they believe what do they do with it once they start to learn it okay so this ends up being a, a happy thing but it plays out in a bad way and what Luke is doing is he's linking this event of the Bar Kokhba re rebellion to what will happen later here in 190 to 199 AD which is very interesting because that's the time when the really bad church fathers are inventing the Pope myth okay and that's what's so funny about this because look the text is saying see to it that you that nobody misleads you many will come in my name that's the next phrase that's exactly what was happening in this time from 190 AD and this takes you all the way to 214 AD that's exactly what ends up happening in history is you got this is the period of Irenaeus when he first not Irenaeus but Tertullian when he converts to Christianity he's a real ding-dong and he's the guy who invented the Pope myth okay and he's inventing it right during this period totally misled okay so he's basically saying that he's coming in Christ's name and speaking for Christ was a whole bunch of garbage and that goes on all the way through 214 and the big argument in 214 AD remember to add 30 is that in Rome in particular you got the case of the two Hippolytus is arguing with each other over who's more pure that's Catharos which is where the word Catholic comes from and another guy named Callistus and they were all in Rome they were arguing about how good they were as Christians and because of that um, the rulers in Rome who didn't like the Severan mothers who were ruling at that point anyway they end up they end up instituting a pogrom of Christians and Callistus himself ends up getting murdered and this ends up producing what's called the crisis of the third century in Roman his by Roman historians and what Luke is essentially doing by upping the text to this earlier point is he's showing the cause 
See, if there was no Bar Kokhba rebellion, the rebellion that's taking place here by Christians rebelling against the word of God and making themselves speaking in Christ's name, this rebellion wouldn't have happened. So this rebellion, Bar Kokhba, produced the diaspora, which produced the word getting out, but instead of people listening to what the word said, which Christ is all predicting right here was going to happen, they end, up, they end up not hearing him and make up all this fakakta nonsense about Mary and God knows what else. It's, it's just, you know, we read the Apostolic Fathers and Irenaeus and Tertullian and Origen. It's like you want to throw up. They're so ignorant of Bible and yet they could read the original Greek. So why couldn't they read this original Greek which was warning them? It's not like they didn't know about syllable counts. Well, but they didn't care. They want to speak for Christ. Many will therefore come in my name. Yeah. They're coming in his name and they're speaking as if they were speaking for him. But they're not speaking for him because they're going against and rebelling. Just like the rebellers here at Bar Kokhba. False Christ. See what's so funny about that? See, and here's the next line in Luke. Many will come in my name saying that I am he. Yeah, that's exactly what the Bar Kokhba rebellion was about. A guy named Bar Kokhba said that he was the Christ. And as a result of that, Jerusalem is raised. And including the temple. And a pig temple is put up where the Holy of Holies is. That was the first abomination. Okay? So our boy here, Luke, is moving this same text upward to the cause of the abominating stuff that will be said by Tertullian and Irenaeus and jerk off origin all in here which ends up causing you know the the Christians to get expelled and even killed from Rome so you see there's a parallel between this historical event Bar Kokhba where a lot of people get killed and expelled and these guys talking here pretending that they're speaking for Christ also. And they end up getting a lot of Christians killed and expelled from Rome. Okay, so you want to pay real close attention, and it's really intricate to do that, to how Luke moves the phrases. Because he's tying a causal here, it's earlier. He's tying causation for this later text that Christ had already said. Now that's the purpose of prophecy. I don't know if you've noticed, but all prophecy is supposed to be progressive. What that means is that God will say something and it's a little bit, and then a later voice God will hire to say something else that's an elaboration on prior writ. That's what's going on here. Luke is actually saying this from the Holy Spirit, which of course he says in Luke 1, but people don't pay close attention to it. My pastor paid attention to it. He knew that, so he's not the only one who understood. Luke is claiming divine inspiration here. And now he's showing it to you. He's updating the prophecy of what, what Christ says here back to its cause. It's a common theme in Greek drama also. Is that you have one play and then another play that comes later explains something of the origin of the first play, like a prequel. That's what you got going on here. That this this is what Christ said originally. Okay. Now Luke repackages the same words back to their cause. So you got a rebellion here which results in diaspora. So here's the diaspora occurring up here. 169, 184, which is really 199 A.D. to 214 A.D. And that's taking place in Rome. Actually, Tertullian was in Lyon, a.k.a. Lugudnum. But, you know, he there were lots of jerks that were in Rome, too. And in northern Africa, like Demetrius of Alexandria, and a bunch of and origin, a bunch of idiots like that. And they were all claiming to speak for Christ. And they were all rebelling against God just as much as down here in Luke at the Bar Kokhba. They're all speaking in his name. 
Or as Barkakpa was literally doing, I claiming to be him. Of course, Barkakpa is long dead by the time this text is, you know, enacted. So, it's pretty pithy and wry and satirical that Luke moves the text up to 112 to Bar Kokhba to explain what happens 57 years later under Tertullian and Origen and all those other jerks that wrecked Christianity and have wrecked it ever since. Because we don't really read what they say and if you ever read what Origen or Tertullian or Irenaeus and all those other guys say, if you actually read them you would you would want to stop being a Christian. You, you can't be an honest Catholic or Calvinist and read the Church Fathers and respect what they say. They lie worse than Donald Trump. They make Donald Trump's lies look like virtue. Okay, all I have to do is read them. Just read them yourself and watch what stupid things they say. So see, we were forewarned. And Luke here is showing the origin of the warning that comes down here at 169-184 by Christ himself. Luke just repackages, reorders what Christ says to show cause. Now, if you can't figure out that Luke is deliberately playing on Matthew in order to make a very wry point, then maybe you just shouldn't watch my videos anymore because I don't know what else I can do to help. Peace out.